All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. Elon Ferdman here, and I'm really excited to find out more about our guest today. The stories that she shared with me on the pre-interview were um, pretty amazing. So for any of you guys that have been on the entrepreneurial journey, I think this is going to be a highlight podcast for you. So first of all, Brianna Zaychek, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's an honor. I'm I'm really excited. Uh, we had a, a fun time chatting on the pre-interview, and I'm sure this is going to be an absolutely awesome conversation. So, before we get into all the nitty gritty stuff, why don't you tell people a little bit about what you're up to, a little bit about your story, whatever uh, feels good for you to share? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, what I'm working on is called the One Year Project, and what I am aiming to do is create a mass movement of people who understand the power that we have to transform our lives and that you can do it in a relatively short time frame if you're equipped with the right tools and the right mindset. And so the one year project is really about designing a life that you love, a business that you love in just one year. Yeah. Amazing. Now, how did you come to that passion based project? So this passion-based project um, kind of started, I'd say, a few years back when I was working on my PhD, and I was doing a lot of research into um, how to build an algorithm to predict if an entrepreneur will or will not be successful. So I was working in AI, and I wanted to have an AI that could tell you if someone's going to be successful or not. And the theory kind of came about in that if a VC or a Shark Tank type group of people were sitting in a room and someone came to pitch to them, within the first few seconds of that person pitching, almost all of them would know if they think this person is going to be successful or not. <laughs> and usually they were fairly correct. And it wasn't because they just have this, you know, magic answer, but it was more so that um, the way we think is if you see something 10,000 times, 10,000 different pitches, and you know what successful ones look like and don't, we tend to build internal patterns of what success looks like. And so our mind's actually doing these complex computations that um, we don't even know are happening or know how to, you know, <laughs> explain. Um, but I wanted to see how do we replicate that so that we don't have to rely on everyone's individual, you know, formula, but can come up with something a little more concrete. And I dive deep into that. And as I was doing it, I started to uncover what I consider the patterns of success. So what are the patterns of success in a successful mindset? And so I kind of started to ask some questions of, well, how does a successful entrepreneur think? Because maybe that's really what, where, where it's happening. And can you teach someone entrepreneurship or is it born or are they made an entrepreneur? Um, and really just going from there, I, I found the patterns of success and I wanted to share them because my main complaint was that with research, everything's published in the scientific journal that you know, goes off and only the people who read them and write them ever have access to it. But sure. what doesn't happen is how do you take this data? How do you take this truth? How do you take what we know to be true and turn it into actions that people can take? And so the one year project said, okay, what if I took everything I knew to be true about fulfillment, success, happiness, and I turned it into, you know, a system that someone can complete in one year, one action a day for 365 days. What would that look like and what kind of results would they get? That is fascinating. Now, what was your background before you did this? Were you in the, in the VC world? So before I did this, I've had several startups. And so maybe I should go pretty, back, pretty yeah. far back to kind of explain my history. I grew up really uh, impoverished in a small town. And my parents, you know, my mother hadn't graduated high school. My father dropped out of college. Um, you know, we, I think I lived in 14 to 16 different places before I graduated high school because we get evicted so frequently. Wow. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot, a lot of poverty. We didn't have running water at times. We didn't have power or electricity at times. And so it became really hard for me to kind of live in this world where that's just a given that people have those basic things. Um, and it, it was really easy for me to feel like an outsider. And I always had this feeling from a very young age that I'm different, I'm not like these people, and that I was going to get out of it, that this was very temporary. I can remember thinking that as young as three years old, uh, that I could feel sorry for my family, I could feel bad for them, I could also see how they made the decisions they made, but I could also see that I was never going to 
think like them or live like them. So I remember thinking that from a very young age. And the older I got, the more clarity <laughs> came around that. So around the age of 16, um, I had this feeling that if I didn't get out of that small town now, I never would. And it became this really certain feeling that I knew I had to leave and that I couldn't wait until I graduated high school. So I actually, without letting my parents know, I went behind their back and I found a way to graduate high school early and apply to a lot of colleges and get scho got scholarships. So right before I'm supposed to be going into to like my junior year, we're in like Walmart, we're getting school supplies for the next year and we go to check out and I'm like, hey mom, I can't let you buy these because if I said, because I'm not going to school next year, she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I actually start college in two weeks. And so that was kind of the beginning point of me taking charge of that potential I knew I had. Um, and then from there, I went through so many things, you know, there are ups and downs, the poverty mindset, if that's all you've ever known, takes a long time to break through. Yeah. Um, and so from there, I ended up, you know, kind of being a server at one point who dropped out of college. And I really knew that everything was temporary. There's always this plan that I was gonna overcome it, uh, but it, it took a while. And so when I finally did, you know, it took like, but the transformations would be that I would go from a server to, you know, making $3 an hour to owning a house where there's no potential reason why I should be able to own a house or purchase a house at that point. Or I go from a server to making six figures in only six months and with still without an education. So when I started out, I was a server and I really knew I needed to get out of this. At the time I was, I was um, doing civil engineering, so I had an internship um, and I had the, the traditional mindset of you go to college, you get a degree that makes good money and then you make good money and that's it, right? Um, and I started to realize through that internship that it was all bullshit because I was like, you know what? I'm sitting here and all I'm doing is like verifying an equation for somebody who's doing a draft, who's doing that for somebody who's doing this. And I started to learn the bureaucracy in the system and that you can't just go out and design a skyscraper or a bridge tomorrow, no matter how brilliant you are, that you don't get that opportunity until you're like 50. So first you verify their equations, then you verify their drafts, and then you make their drafts so they put the name on it and blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't willing to sit around and wait through that system. So I had a lot of friends in technology and I said, you know what, that's where people can grow quickly. So why not try that? And I actually applied to, I think, 100 to 150 jobs a day for about uh, months. And so that I could get a job where I could get out of just being a server. And I got an opportunity to be uh, kind of like an admin assistant technology company. Um, but going from $3 an hour to $18 an hour seemed like a lot of money. And I told the CEO when I got there, I said, what problems do you have? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what problems do you have? And I'm like, any problem you have, I'll fix it. So that was the wow. very first day I said, any problem you have, I'll fix it. So for some reason I built the rapport that he believed that. So he gave me a whole list of every issues having in his company from cash flow to, you know, people manager to everything. So I'd work all day doing my job, which was like to book travel. And then in the night, and when I had time, I'd spend an extra five or 10 hours going from department to department and meeting the director and saying, hey, what problems do you have? I'll fix them. And I was able to kind of help take that company from 6 million to 40 million in 18 months. And along the way, I became the vice president of the company. Wow. Um, so that was my entryway. And then from there, I started building my own companies. So I was like, why am I making someone else rich? I, want, I wanted the freedom to, to do it for myself. Um, so I started my first company. Um, not too many months after that, and six months after starting my first company, it was like an AI gaming company. It was acquired before it even went to market. Um, and then from there, started several other companies um, from, and was involved as a partner in several companies, um, many of them getting acquired and selling and all sorts of things. And um, it, was, it was crazy, but you know, I always had this ability throughout my life to create almost like a master plan and execute it to get exactly what I wanted in a very short time frame. And then once I got to my PhD, I you know studied the science behind it, and then it kind of it kind of transformed into my life's work. Where it's like, okay, I know how to accomplish things quickly, and I know the science of success, and I know how to create a plan based on action. And if I combine those two together, what does that mean? And I feel like a lot of people have this. You know, I know I'm meant for more. I'm not reaching my potential. I believe in myself. I have a huge dream, 
well, what do you wake up tomorrow and do to get one step closer? Yeah. You know, the overwhelm is in the how to get there. And no one addresses that, right? In a lot of law of attraction stuff, we say, don't worry about the how. Okay, but you have to take some action, right? Yep. Um, and then in, in a lot of other people, they'll spend months taking the wrong actions, right? And so how do you make sure that a year from now, you're significantly closer to your dream life than you are right now? Wow, that is an unreal story. Um, I'm just... There's so many things that I want to ask you right now. I'm trying to prioritize them here in, in a second. So one of the things I just want to point out, is like your, the beauty is that you unlocked your gift early on. And by that, I, I mean, you, it was unconscious. Like, I don't think you were consciously aware of the gift that you had at the time, but that ability to realize, like, I see problems and I have structures in my head. Like, you probably see the world in a very systematic way where you can kind of see, okay, it's like a big puzzle for you and all the pieces fit and you make them fit, which for a young person, first time working in a big company to say that, to have the balls to say that to the owner of the company is just absolutely monumental. And the fact that you then were like, I have this kind of gift. I should probably study what this thing is. And then when learn the science behind what you're doing yeah, yeah. Uh, to then create all these, you know, the AI technology is just absolutely brilliant. I'm curious because now the new project is very different, right? Like you've, your skill clearly is you can start really, really successful companies and, and have a roadmap how to get them acquired before you even launch them. So, you know, in, in a short period of time, build companies and sell them. And you could do that and people make a life, I mean, multiple legacy lifetime money out of doing that. So I guess my first question is this new project of yours, the one year project is very, very different. Yeah. It, it's not a, this is not like a play to, to be acquired. No. This sounds to me way more of a heart centered, uh, passion project to give back. Yes. So being that I came from finance and I also kind of went through that, you know, shift, I'm curious, what was the, what was the turnaround for you? And what did you find out in your life to, to kind of like, this is a really different path. Yeah. So, you know, when you grow up really poor, a lot of times you tend to think that the answer is in money because all the problems you've ever known have surrounded, you know, I've been surrounded by money. Like, oh, you know, someone got pulled over, got arrested because they couldn't afford car insurance. Well, obviously the money for car insurance would solve that problem, right? Or like, oh, we got evicted because we couldn't pay our rent, right? So, so when you grow up in that mindset, I always had this idea that money would solve all of my problems. Mm. And so I got to this point um, where I had built this one company. Um, it was my main bread and butter. It was over seven figures and I was working maybe three to four hours a week. So you could consider that <laughs> living the dream, right? Yep. Working about three to four hours a week. Didn't go in the office. Didn't really do very much. Um, and I traveled the world, a lot of, you know, yachts and parties and nightclubs and, you know, all the things you do when you finally make it right. You know, I when go you're young and have money. <laughs> yeah. I go out and bought myself a Porsche. I had the house. Yeah. You know, traveling all the world, it, it seemed like I had everything. And along the way, I'd gotten some other great things from a family standpoint too. I'd gotten married and, you know, I'd had children and like everything was as perfect as much as what everyone wishes for, right? Like I had good kids. I had a good marriage. I had good money. I had good finances. And I, you know, but I wasn't satisfied because I'd been coasting along making this, you know, working three to four hours a week and knowing that I wasn't reaching my potential, knowing that it wasn't that I was passionate about it, but that I liked the money and the lifestyle. And it was cool to sit around for a few years and not really reach for something new. Um, but at the same time, then there's this question of, you know, I'm, I, I, there's this, there was always this impact I felt I was, I was meant to make. I always felt like I'm going to make a difference. And so I knew I wasn't working on anything that was bringing me towards that. So my first thought was, you know what, I'm always the smartest person in the room. And they have that saying, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I thought, I just need to be surrounded by other people. I never had a mentor. I would mm. never had anyone who I looked to for advice and said, everyone had always looked to me for advice. And so I wanted to be surrounded by people who I thought were more intelligent than me. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go get a PhD. That's going to solve the problem. Right? 
So I was totally unqualified to get a PhD because I dropped out of college several times. And after I dropped out of college several times, I got kicked out one time. Um, and then <laughs> after that, I go back and, and managed to get a degree in a couple months and make like all A's, but it was like online from not a very good college. And now here all of a sudden I wanted to get a PhD from prestigious university. So I was like, okay, how am I gonna figure this out? So applied my, my usual tactics and managed to get the per find the person I wanted to work with at the university I wanted to work with and offer to work with them for free and give them some of my help for a few months so that I knew that once I applied, I'd get in. So went, went through all this effort to get in. And I was thinking, the reason why I want this is because I want to be an author, I want to be a speaker, I want to create something which changes the way we live our lives. And I also thought that, you know, I wanted to make a mass impact. And I know that a lot of professors and researchers have some sort of work which makes a huge impact. So that was kind of my thought process and the intellectual freedom, the freedom that someone could pay me to find and work on my life's work and that that would be my sole purpose. So I get in there and within, I'd say a couple of weeks, I was totally let down and disappointed. And mm. it didn't answer any of those problems for me. I wasn't fitting in, I was an outcast again. Um, everyone could follow the rules, I couldn't seem to follow the rules. There was a set of bureaucracy that I couldn't <laughs> operate within because I've been an entrepreneur for so long. And not only that, some of the things I wanted, like the intellectual freedom, wasn't really there the way I thought it was going to be there. And I was really disappointed. And then I was, it was even worse because I kind of moved my family. I'd done all this stuff. I'd rearranged everyone's life to kind of make this happen. And then I kind of woke up one day and I said, I don't want to answer my emails to the company that's making me millions of dollars. I don't want to go to class and work on this thing that I worked so hard to get into that everyone's counting me on, on me out for and believing in me in. And there's nothing about my day-to-day -day life that I want to get up and live in. And it was kind of this, this you know, interesting realization. Oh. Um, and right around that time, um, my son was diagnosed with cancer. And so that was also this huge kind of like, you know, a speed bump in the, in the big thing of things. Uh, and so I stopped and I remember one night I was sitting in my bed with my laptop and I opened up PowerPoint and I titled it Brianna Zychek's Life. And I, I knew at that point I'd identified something. I said, you know what? I'm excellent at setting goals and achieving them. But if I'm not happy once I achieve them, then maybe I've been chasing the wrong goals. Mm -hmm. And so then I came to this question, maybe what I think I want isn't what I really want. So how do I dig a little deeper? So I filled this PowerPoint with everything, like pictures, words, everything I could probably think of, almost like a vision board or something. And then I saved it and I think it was like 2 a.m. My husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, look at my PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, and I asked him something, I said, give me one year. He's like, I'll give you one year. I mean, like you have all the time in the world. You have all the freedom in the world. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Give me one year. But like, I felt like I needed permission to do whatever I wanted to do for one year without someone, anyone's opinion mattering. Mm. Without a, oh, you should be going and making money at the company. You know how to go make money. Or you should do this. Or you should do that without anything. Like I can be crazy for a year. <laughs> I wanted that level of permission. And so from there, I went down this personal journey of the reason why I set the wrong goals must be because I didn't know what I really wanted, which must be because I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. So I said, who am I? And that, that's where I really started. Maybe I don't really know myself the way I think I do. So I started with that and I started asking myself weird things like, okay, when you're drunk in the back of an Uber, what do I talk to the cab driver about, you know? Um, and then I realized that I was always sharing my story and trying to inspire them and giving them hope and courage. And then I thought, Okay, what are some things I've always, I'm very good at? Well, I'm good at, you know, starting companies. So, you know, kind of started from there. Um, and really, I got to a point where everything that ever happened to me in my life and everything I cared about came together in what I now call the one-year project. And I said, this is it. This is my life's work. This is finally the thing that I'm not itching to build, create, walk away from, do something else and sell because those things weren't very fulfilling um, because they weren't challenging and they weren't something that, that I really wanted to stick with. And so this is really the first thing I wanted to stick with. Um, and along the way, I really had to come to grips with who, who I am 
and how to figure that out and how to set goals that are aligned with who you are. Mm -hmm. So I started asking myself like, well, how do I design a life for who I am? How do I design a business that supports who I am? And so when I talk about the one year project, I always tell people, I help you, you know, design your life, a life in business, your own life in business, your own dream life in business and achieve it in one year. And so a lot of times it's not the goals that you think you want. And, yeah. and I help people dig through that and really see it because let's say you want a Ferrari. Well, do you want a Ferrari because you want to show up, you know, in valet and be the center of attention, or do you want to be, have a Ferrari because, uh, you want the respect and admiration of your dad or to prove that you've made it because you don't feel like you've made it or do you want it because you just like fast cars and like to race like yep. those are all very very different reasons and if you want it for the respect or you want it for the center of attention and you get it and all of a sudden the valley guy disrespects you or all of a sudden there's eight Ferraris and you're not the center of attention then you're going to be left with that need unfulfilled. So really thinking about at my core what feelings mean the most to me. And how do I satisfy those outside of the goals? And then it makes sure the goals all line up with it. Brianna, you are so wise. I don't know if people are listening to this in the car or watching this on YouTube. Like you are so wise beyond your years. And I actually asked Brianna, you know, who her teachers have been and how this all happened. And like, there's been no one, right? You haven't worked with anybody or anything like that. I mean, you joined one mastermind, I think you told me, but you didn't. I, I joined one mastermind this year, so that's been a couple of months. But I would say that the vast majority of my success has been self-guided. Um, and in fact, since I've taken, t recently taken on some help and you know, trying to find advisors and mentors and masterminds, I've had a hard time with that because um, a lot of times what people don't think is, you know, people think that the mentor and the mastermind, all these things are the answer to success and you'll get the advice you need, blah, blah, blah. But from a person who's always operated very instinctually yep. and very in tune with myself and yep. common sense and, you know, how I work and think, it's been very difficult for me to take other people's advice who have what I want or are where I want or know about something that I don't know about and still hold true to who I am and what I'm feeling and thinking. And so I've had to, to say, okay, how do I move from overthinking, which when you have too many opinions when you have too much advice is very, very common into yep. acting from my heart. How do I know, you know, which one to do? Um, and, and I've just started to sort that out, but yeah, for the most part, um, it's been me on my own trying to figure everything out. Yeah. So it's really interesting because you are so analytical and your gift is so logic and very, I mean, like, j just so you know, sure. So someone that is going through a question like, who am I that goes to a PowerPoint presentation like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that yeah. just tells you like how your mind works and it's beautiful. Like, I just love how you've done that. And this journey that you're on to, I think you've come to grips, like that produces epic results in your life mm -hmm. and those results, you know, and it, it's so funny, like the story that you shared, I was writing, this is the life of pretty much everyone until they start to tap into spirituality or personal development or like digging in. Right. It's external fixes. Okay. I'm broke. I feel poor. I don't feel accepted. I don't feel like I belong. Okay. So I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to go get money. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go at the Porsche. Okay. That didn't solve the problem. Okay. Maybe what I need to do is everyone's married. That's what's making people. Out. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go find the man. Okay. I find the man. Okay. <laughs> that didn't do it. Okay. I'm going to have some kids. Okay. I'm going to have some kids. No, yeah. that didn't do it. Okay. So it's, it's, think everything's it's, external it's, when it's all internal. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so we we're like constantly fishing, 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 like, but you, you just did it at like rapid fire, you know, like people don't achieve things at the level, like externally that you did. So they don't necessarily get to that level that quickly where mm -hmm. they kind of get to that place and they go, yeah. Oh shit. None of that is the answer in here is the only answer. So yeah. you, you've had it. I'm like, you know, nitrous <laughs> speed sure. 
to get there, which is so beautiful. And now, you know, like people ask, I'm sure they ask you all the time, but like people ask me at a networking event, okay, what do you do? I'm like, all right, have you ever heard of the 80 20 rule? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, so you probably realize that 20% of the things you do move the needle at all, right? So you're yeah. taking all these actions that don't mean anything. And, and to your point and your story, it's like a lot of the reason that is, is because we take action. It's exactly like you said, because the source of the action isn't in alignment with who we are. Yeah. So we're taking action to prove to our dad, to prove to others, to fill in all these voids that we have. And so clearly the only actions that ever move the needle are those that are in pure alignment with you internally, your heart, your true self, your super conscious. And then that, that moves the needle. So like I tell people, okay, what if you could take one action that does 10 X what any other action does? And that's the only action you took because to find that action, you asked, by the way, who am I is the ultimate question of a human being. Yeah. Like that is the only question worth asking because when you, and, and it's an ever moving thing, right? Like, yeah. And I'm not the same person at any one given point. Right. Exactly. So you're constantly asking that question, who am I? And it's an exploration, but the exploration is here deep inside. And that's the beauty of the question that it keeps unraveling and keeps opening and you keep releasing these layers. And if you tune in, which is what you've been doing and actually finding the inspired action, and just following that from your heart. I think I said to this to you on the pre-interview, like one of my biggest pet peeves with mentors and trainers and coaches is that they become a crutch for people and they try to fit everyone into the box. And because something worked for them, they're like, here's how you do it. Yeah. But that's not, that's not teaching. That's just like regurgitating what worked for you. Mm -hmm showing someone how to dive deep inside of themselves so that they can find the answers yeah. and unlock more of who they are so that they get to shine out in the world. Like, Absolutely. That's, like showing, yeah, showing someone how to find their own path is very different than trying to force them through your path, right? Yep. And so I think that there is, you know, there's this big idea that there is an answer, there is a right and wrong. And I, I challenge that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that we each have our own, you know, set of right and wrong. And so there is no magic answer to make money online. There is no one funnel that works. There is no one strategy that works. It's all very, very personalized to who you are. Yeah. And, and so that, that really matters. And so for someone, they, they might want the flashing red button, you know, 10 minutes left on their funnel. And for someone else, ethically, that doesn't match with them. Yeah. And so they might get a higher conversion doing something else because their heart will be behind it. Yeah. And so really, I, I always challenge people who think there is a right and wrong way. You know, oh, this is the way you make sales. Oh, this is the way you build a company. And the truth is that the, none of that is true. You can make money a million ways. I know people who make $300,000 a month who have no website. And I know people who make, you know, $300,000 a month because they have a kick-ass website, right? And so there really is no right or wrong answer. Um, and when you can come to realization with that, then no one really knows the right or wrong answer. All they know is what worked for them. And all that they can help you do is find what will work for you. Yeah. And so if you can realize that, then the external pressure to do the things that you think lead to what you think you want kind of is, is a lifted, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in your early stages of career where it was more about proving something, I think the thing that kept driving the success was that hunger to find self. Like every stepping stone for you has been another and, layer of and self. in some way everything i did was was very you know even misaligned but aligned with myself you know because i knew i was destined to impact a large amount of people yep. i knew i was destined to be successful i know wealth is a part of that so every decision i made is going to help me with all those things that are very rich me um and so going through that 
is all, you know, the, the path to getting there, the journey is just as important as the destination. And truly there is no destination. Until the moment you take your last breath, there will never not be another thing. Um, and so some people think you'll get to a point to where it's like, oh, okay, I, you know, that's it, I'm satisfied. But, you know, as long as we're alive, we're changing, we're, we're growing, we're moving, we're wanting more, desiring more and everything. Um, so it never stops. Yeah. yeah, so good. It's so good. Brianna, you're like our, um, the, the people that we work with. It, it's exact, it's always the same story. And it's so funny. I'm just so amazed at how aware you were through the entire process. Like most people that go through that process kind of, it's almost like a, I don't know, depending, but let's say like a roughly a five-year process where it's like a slow degradation of self-hatred where they kind of like go to bed and they just hate themselves a little bit more and they wake up and they hit themselves a little bit more, not in a bad way, but just it's like the misalignment just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And then the heart just gets louder and louder and louder. And and you go to bed and it's yelling at you like you are not doing what you're supposed to do. And you wake up and it's like, God, I'm telling you, this is not what we're supposed to do. But the money is attractive and the prestige. You can't get trapped by your own success. And a lot of people don't understand that. Um, But you can get trapped by your own success. One question I ask myself, which is still one of my favorite questions I ask myself is, if I know I'm going to impact a large amount of people, if I know without a doubt that I'm meant for greatness and, and to make an impact and all these different things, then what if everything in my life was exposed right now? Mm. Right? And so I asked myself almost like an ethical question. If tomorrow I were impacting a hundred million people and the lights and the camera and everything were on me, would I be in a position to handle that, right? And so a, a, a large part of my transformation also was thinking, how do I ethically clean up my life? How do I clean up my life to where I'm ready for greatness? Mm. So that if someone shines a camera on me, I have no fear that you know I'm misaligned in some way with the person that I really am. Yeah. Right? And that's a, that's a very powerful question because some of you say like, I want a New York Times bestseller. Well, if you had a New York Times bestseller tomorrow, would you be prepared for that level of greatness? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times the answer is no. And so we're going through all these, you know, hiccups and things like that. And it seems like it's taking forever because, you know, we're weeding out the bullshit, you know, if you're not ready for it, you don't want to blow your shot. Right. And so you've got to make sure that when you get the opportunity, yeah. you are the right person for that opportunity. Yeah. What's really interesting is that I have found, and there are exceptions, I have found that it's like relationships, you know, um, are you still married? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, you know, like relationships is one of those things that when you are ready for people that, you know, marry their soulmates, let's say, cause sure. I'm, not, I'm not talking about the 50% that get divorced, but like true soulmates, like when you meet them, you prepare yourself in order for that person to show up. Yeah. Likewise with, uh, success in business and things like that, you prepare yourself to be worthy of receiving and accepting Mm -hmm. the seven figure business or the massive book deal, et cetera. Now there are exceptions. And I believe that those exceptions come with that person needs to learn a very valuable lesson in maybe not quite being prepared. And that's, you know, their life journey or whatever it is. It's really interesting though. Like when people, something I I share with people all the time is like, you will only ever receive that which you are worthy of at any given time. So like you want to look at what you have right now. That's, that's the level that you believe you're worthy of. You want to achieve more. You want to receive more Then you get to always look at where, and, and the worthy conversations are like for you, you know, growing up, it's like, you even said it yourself, being impoverished creates a whole bunch of fucking programs that you as growing up, like, as you start expanding, it's like, wow, that's an old program. That doesn't yeah. serve me. Okay, upgrade that. That's an, And you just keep peeling that layers so you can receive that abundance. And um, it's just, a, it's an ongoing, never ending till the last breath 
my Journey. my mom used to have this saying growing up she was very religious but she used to have the saying that um god won't give you more if you're not taking care of what he's already given you so mm -hmm. she would say that anytime like she got into your car and you had like cups and bottles and trash and napkins everywhere she'd be like you're not going to get blessed with a new car if you can't take care of the one you have mm -hmm. right so there was always this thing that if you can't respect what you've been gifted then there is no reason for the universe or god or whoever to gift you anything more mm -hmm. right and it's something that i still think about to this day um is that you know are you respecting the gifts that you have are you making the most of them That's are you respecting the opportunities that you have are you respecting the people that you have because if you want better people if you want better things if you want you know better opportunities then you have to respect the ones you have yeah it's uh it's like a chinese chicken uh chinese chicken trap <laughs> <laughs> chinese, chinese finger trap uh and for me this is also a really big awakening you know like you go to bed and i don't know certain people go to bed i'm sure people that listen here and just do different visualization exercises things like that and a lot of the times we're like, I want that. I want this. I want that. Right. And you really envision that life. And um, something that I've been taught and, and now sharing with people, it's like you have to start with a foundation of gratitude for exactly what you have. Because if you start with this, like, I want that, I want this, I want that. In essence, what you're saying is what I currently have in my possession isn't good enough. And as soon as you do that, you're basically locking yourself into the circumstance and situation that you're in right now. Whereas I, I agree with your mom 100%. It's like, think about even your experience. You, if you were to give a gift to someone, a friend, whatever, and they just totally neglected it and like didn't take. Then would you go out and buy them something nicer exactly. for their next birthday? Not. No. You're not. No. If you buy them a $300 sweater and they never wear it, the next birthday, they're getting a hundred dollar gift card, right? That's it. <laughs> so it's like, um, it's very, very true. The the more you can appreciate and respect and be grateful for what you have, the more ready you are for what's next. Absolutely, yeah, so beautiful. And even if you have nothing, you have an abundance of air around you to breathe, right? Like yeah. there is always something to be grateful for. And a lot of people think that in their situation, they have nothing to be grateful for. And, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's crazy, but, you know, breaking out of a cycle of ungratefulness is, is crazy. One of, when my son was diagnosed with cancer, it's, it's one of those moments where you can say, woe is me, what did I do to deserve this, right? Like you can go down that negative path. And I actually had this sense of gratitude and it was hard for my husband to understand. I said, I'm grateful it happened to us and not someone else. He's like, how can you say that you're grateful that that horrible thing happened to you? I'm like, well, we both had the opportunity to work from home. We both had the financial resources to pay for the best of care. We wow. both have, we're in a place where we can just drop everything and work on this and other people when this thing happens to them, it's like, which parent is quitting, quitting their job? Who's selling the house, selling their house. They're living at Ronald McDonald house, you know, like they're, 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 they're in a position that's, that's much less favorable. And at the same time I said, you know, I'm even happen, happy it happened to this kid because I know this kid and I know that he's got a strength in him that I don't see in a lot of other kids. Mm -hmm. So there was zero doubt that we wouldn't make it out the other end. And there was zero you know, and I knew, and what was interesting is they always, um, this lady comes in and she's talking to you and they give you all this information about the ways you can get involved in the cancer community. It's like, oh, you can run this race and your kid, your kid who's not sick can go to this summer camp and you do this and that. And I said, sorry, we're not interested. And she's like, oh, you really need this more battle for it. Can you I said, I really understand that. I said, but cancer isn't taking over our life. So we don't need any of that. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, this, it was this very big decision that's like, we're not now living life with this bad thing that's happened. It's like, no, we're going to the hospital once a week and that's it. It's just a, one extra trip a week to hospital, right? So when you, when you make things into a bigger deal than they are, you're, you're, you're letting yourself wallow in something that might not even be the truth. And so it's important that you can see, see things for what they are, right? And see that everything is temporary um and it's really only how you react to it that that matters the most so good so good um 
I'm really curious because you sound to me like someone who's always in, in discovery and exploration mode in your life. Um, and you said something interesting before, like that question of when I'm impacting 100 million people and all the lights are on me and things like that. Sure. Um, what is it that you're in exploration of now? What's the area of life that you're at work? What's the inquiry that you're in? Okay. So my inquiry now is in figuring out if I am being scared or patient hmm. because now that I found my life's work and I'm not in the situation where I need to make a ton of money for it. Right. Um, I've been patient, which isn't how I've been historically by nature. So patience is something that's new to me. Um, and because I think about it, like I have my whole life, so it's a marathon, not a race. So I don't have to like chop, chop, chop. Um, and so things like, well, monetizing it and all these sorts of things, I'm kind of taking slow and not doing it. And so right now my inquiry is, am I taking it slow strategically or am I too afraid to put it on full throttle? So that's really my current question, right? Is, um, is this coming from a p place of peace and surrender or to what is and knowing it will, because there is a deep knowing it's happening. Yep. Or, and so I don't have to push as hard or is this a way of me being afraid and waiting until I'm less afraid. Mm. And so that's really, that's really what I'm trying to, to figure out now. Um, and I've had to be very careful of the language I use because I'm very funny about language and uh, how the Same. things speak. And so I've caught myself saying some things that I didn't really like it. So I might say, um, like uh, there have been times I call myself saying like, oh, I don't want to make money from this right now. And it's like, well, uh -huh. why do you say I don't want to make money from this right now? Right. Or, you know, just little things. Right. Um, and so really just paying careful attention to what I say, because it can reveal a lot, a lot of other things. And then how do I deal with that? And yeah. I think for me, the difference is that when I was building a company for the purpose of getting rich then the purpose was to make money. And a lot of times, like I was selling companies to fortune 500 companies. So if I go into Coca-Cola and I'm selling them a company, uh, it's chop, chop, get the money. I don't feel guilty or bad for Coca-Cola, right? But when there's someone who wants to transform their life in one year, the, the, the feeling of charging people has been a little hard for me to, um, to deal with, I guess. And so I'm so trying beautiful. to kind of work through that. So beautiful. Brianna, there's this um, honesty and vulnerability that you have that is incredibly endearing and like, well, thank you. Very magnetic. And, you know, to, to, if I could offer you a couple of things, one about the, you know, when you were talking about the hundred million people and the lights on, if you just be this and just be you and whatever, look, I mean, when, when you're impacting a hundred million people, trust me, there's going to be people that hate you. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's inevitable, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just inevitable. You can't please everyone and that's fine. You're not there to please everyone. You're there yeah. to create massive impact in the world. And, um, I think as long as you're honest and true and integrous with yourself, uh, people will always find shit to nitpick. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I think you, you, you can hone in on that. Um, the other thing is what's really interesting, and this is just something uh, that I picked up. You're, so you're big on language, right? So even in the, even in the language of I'm figuring it out, that's here. Mm -hmm. So how do I do, how do I figure mm -hmm. out? That's all brain. So that yeah. like brings you back. So to moving you. from head to heart is, is this huge for me. It's constant, that constant exactly, reminder. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So anytime you catch yourself, like I'm figuring this out, you mm -hmm. can just be like, Oh, I'm, I'm in my head. Mm -hmm. So that answer, I think to what you're trying to, and it's so funny because my whole thing is also patience. So I'm yeah. like massive. I'm, I'm just such a good <laughs> starter and I like fly out the gate and I have no brakes. I'm like a million miles an hour. I'm the guy, by the way, with the Ferrari, like I just love to drive really fast and race. Yeah. Cars. 
you know, yeah. but like, that's my entire life. Yeah. So, that's how I've been my entire life. So now this patience thing, it's like, I know. I can't figure out if it's right or not. You know? I know. So, so I could just share with you. I'm normal. Yeah. I could share with you my experience. And like, this is when we, when we started building this company, I had never invested so much of me in anything before mm-hmm. where I wasn't seeing the results. Like everything I did as a kid, I excelled at incredibly fast. Sure. And, and truth be told, like if I didn't, ex- I just wasn't doing it. Right. So like, there's so many things I excelled at. I was like, if I didn't do well at this, I was like, ah, fuck it. I have these 19 other things. Yeah. When I started this business, it was the first time it was bigger than me. And I think that's where you're dealing with now. It's like, it's a mission. It's a life mission till your dying breath type work. And I remember just like working so hard at the beginning. Now I just, I, you know, we've created this like flow and ease and grace around yeah. things happening. But like, I just remember that most, that momentum and just, no, like no real results. Like I couldn't yeah. show someone like, Hey, look at all this, you know, there's no money in the bank, but <laughs> I knew, I knew that the mission was moving forward. Like yeah. the, the, the metrics had to change a little bit. Yeah. So I and remember when you, saying, when you've been successful, it's hard because people think, yes. Oh, Brianna Mil- builds multi-million dollar companies. She's got the eight and nine figures. And it's like, okay, well, what has she been working on for six months? that has no money in the bank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's this pressure externally as well that everything you do is an immediate success financially yes. as where, you know, there are times when it's better to lay a correct foundation before you worry about the money. Yeah. There's also, there's also this thing. So like I said to myself, you know, I never played life mm-hmm. this way before. I don't even know what kind of results I'm able to produce when I'm patient. Yeah. When I keep building the foundation the long and, game instead of the short game. Yeah. And I don't see the result right away. And so that was kind of like the outset. And then, you know, to, to the question, like, I, I think your journey where it's leading you, I'm, I'm sure right now is dropping in, like you said, from your head to your heart mm-hmm. and creating more moments where you can really tune in in silence, whether it's meditation or walk, whatever your practice is, where it's not so much because like, I know our, our, I'm the same way. It's like, do shit, like do, 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 do. And, you know, do is all mind. So like anytime you're doing is mind. Being, feeling, allowing, creating, all that stuff is heart. And so it takes a little bit of time to just switch systems. I can tell you from my experience, even in the last two years, um, shifting from doing into feeling and allowing like mask, you know, people talk like masculine, feminine energy. So tapping into the feminine energy where life gets to be easy and effortless and flowy. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the results are 10 X anything that I've ever done. And it feels effortless. It yeah. feels like you're just taking a walk in the park and then life just kind of <laughs> sure. starts unfolding. So there's a level of trust mm-hmm. and faith that gets to, be, gets, to be, gets to be developed in that transition. And I just, Brianna, like I love everything that you've shared here and I love that you had everything that you've had to get you to here so that you can do your life's true work and that you figured it out this young. Well, thank you. Cause now there's like a lot of time, a lot of time to go and make that impact in the world. Yes. And yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm honored to have met you. I'm honored to have had you on this podcast. I love what you're up to. I have a feeling we, we can, we can do some amazing things together. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Alon. Uh, I mean, I, I like what you guys are up to as well in the end, in your podcast and it's exciting, you know, you, you don't, there, there's that law that like when you buy a car, everyone else, <laughs> you start seeing all the same car everywhere else. And I think the same comes true with when you find yourself in a position of knowing yourself better 
and being more satisfied and being more spiritual, you tend to find everyone else is the same way too, as we're before, it didn't seem that way. And I think that the, the beautiful support network that that provides mm -hmm. and the potential just becomes multiplied with each person you connect with who is on a, a parallel path. Um, yeah. it, it's awesome to see that. And I'm excited to see where you guys go and, and keep up with you. And I uh, can't wait for what's next. Yeah. I mean, frequency alignment. It's just yeah, a beautiful absolutely. thing. At its uh, best. Brianna, where can people find out about the one-year project, about you? Sure, sure. So my podcast is the One Year Project Podcast. And I, um, I interview a lot of people who rapidly transform their life in just one year. And I also get people in their life who want, who want to transform their life in one year and say, okay, how's that going to happen? Um, and then I document my own journey. So if you want to keep up with my journey of what does it look like? Uh, and I call it becoming Brianna because you're always becoming yourself. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my podcast is one year project podcast. My Instagram is at the one year and I have a Facebook group, which is the one year project as well. So, uh, hopefully you guys can find me everywhere. Amazing. We'll have all the links and stuff in the show notes for you guys. Uh, Brianna truly. Brilliant. Awesome. Absolutely thank brilliant. You so much. I love yeah. it. Yeah. And we'll be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Go ahead over to Brianna's sites and Instagram and Facebook. Send her some love. Let us uh, know how this podcast was for you. And we'll see you on the next one. Have an amazing day, everyone. Awesome.